Okay, what I'm going to give you now is a colloquium which I gave in last year in Oxford and in Trieste. And it is a talk I gave in memory of my ex-supervisor, Professor Dennis Shiyama, who was mentioned briefly yesterday. Dennis Shiyama was a great supervisor in relativity and cosmology whose students included uh, Stephen Hawking and also Martin Rees, the current astronomer royal of Great Britain. And what I want to talk about today, as I said, is something quite different from what I've been doing so far. I want to talk about global to local relations in cosmology. And the themes here is Olbers paradox, Max principle, the arrow of time, and generically relating local to global physics in the universe. And there's a paper about this which is, deals with this in a great a lot of detail in 1972. Uh, in an old book, which is pretty difficult to get hold of nowadays, but uh, there's a detailed book like that. There's a more recent one on the web, which I give you right at the end. Now, the introductory theme in all of this is the unity of the universe. And here's a statement from Dr. Shyama. The universe is not a collection of independent objects. Its different regions strongly influence each other, uh, as though it were a vast machine, all of whose parts are closely linked together, observations of our own immediate neighborhood can be used to obtain information about distant regions of the universe. That's a quote about the unity of the universe. At, what that means is one could in principle deduce the nature of the whole from a study of its parts. Because everything is interlinked, if, if you look closely enough at any local part, it should tell you about the distant parts. So we used in the old days to talk about this in a kind of half-joking but actually quite serious way. One should be able to deduce the expansion of the universe and even the approximate value of the Hubble constant from the existence of bus tickets. You might like, <laughs> you might like to think about that. It's actually rather nice. But the point is distant regions have an important influence on local physics. And that's what I want to talk about in this talk. Um, So the first theme is the uniqueness of the universe, uh, is, is the unity of the universe, and the second theme, which I've already mentioned, is the uniqueness of the universe. And again, from Dr. Sharma, with only one universe available for study, we have no basis for distinguishing between its fundamental and its accidental features. The idea that certain features of the universe are accidental is a somewhat disturbing one. It is possible they would not appear accidental in a more comprehensive theory of the universe. And the point about this in the st study of cosmology is that in, when you look at the universe per se, it is not easy to distinguish between physical laws and boundary conditions. This is a point I want to return to. When you're dealing with local physics, it's easy to say what is a boundary condition and what is a physical law. But when you're dealing with cosmology as a whole, this distinction is not an easy one. What we experience as an inviolable physical law may in fact be the consequence of particular boundary conditions for the universe as a whole. And the point about it is we can't test these features. We are given the boundary conditions for the universe, and so we can't rerun the universe or compare it with any other physically existing universe. And this is why it's actually difficult to distinguish, in the case of cosmology, between initial conditions and boundary conditions. Now, a framework which will at first be a little bit unusual, perhaps. I want to distinguish between bottom-up and top-down interactions. And the way we normally think about this, the way we're kind of trained as physicists, is to think of bottom-up interactions where local physics determines what happens in the universe as a whole. But actually, a lot of what is going on in the universe goes the other way. The universe as a whole has a strong interaction on local physics. And these kind of top-down interactions, which are indicated in that second line, occur and are important in the real universe. They're not emphasized in usual physics discussions, because the usual idea in physics is to talk about an isolated system. Now, there is no isolated system in the real physical universe. And this physical discussion, this idea of the isolated system is an idealization, and it cannot actually be realized in reality. Um, and this comes back again, a similar kind of quote about this isolation. We can only hope to understand any part of the universe by taking account of the whole. That's another way of saying that there are no isolated systems in the real physical universe. 
Now, let's look at some bottom-up interactions. And this is where local physical laws, for instance, the Einstein field equations, determine the large-scale structure of the cosmos. For instance, the Friedman equation, which I wrote down before. And what you have is a local matter density, rho, there. And that local matter density then determines the, the space-time curvature and the rate of expansion of the universe. And we've looked at that in some detail. What this means is in order to, for um, the temperature for the hot Big Bang era, for instance, in order to understand the expansion of the universe, you must know the local physical structure. You must know that the density of the matter consists of neutrinos and anti-neutrinos uh, and mu neutrinos and anti-mu neutrinos and photons. During this time, that gives you at to the fourth plus seven fourth at to the fourth from the neutrinos and the photons, which is related to the temperature. In this way, you put this into the Friedman equation, and from the Friedman equation, you get the time in relation to temperature or the temperature in relation to time during the hot Big Bang epoch. And this is what determines the results of the nuclear synthesis calculations. This is bottom-up interaction. All of these small little particles ganging together to tell the universe at what rate it should expand and therefore the rate at which the temperature of the universe decays. It is also because of the behavior of these local particles, you get the initial singularity in the universe through the Ray Chaudhry equation, which I discussed with you before. Within a finite time ago, there is a singularity. Now, this is because of all these local particles adding up their gravitational attractions. That's bottom-up interaction in the universe, resulting in this extremely dramatic effect, at least according to the classical theory of a singularity at the beginning of the universe. And so, um, bottom-up effects in cosmology, this is what a lot of cosmology is about. It's really very dramatic. And to put this more generally, what you've got in the bottom-up interaction, you've got quantum gravity underlying particle physics, underlying nuclear physics, underlying atomic physics, underlying statistical mechanics, kinetic theory, classical gravity, the fluid picture, the universe. And basically, you've got bottom-up interaction through this hierarchy, in particular, it's the particle physics bottom-up interaction which gives you inflation through quantum fields violating the energy conditions locally, as I briefly mentioned yesterday. And quantum gravity, the wave function of the universe or strings or loop quantum gravity setting the initial conditions which then start off inflation and make the whole of this thing work. So this is this basic idea of the uh, way that bottom-up interaction works from the most fundamental, the most high energy and small scale physics to large scale physics determining what happens in the universe. And further dramatic bottom up effects is for instance the way that quantum fluctuations in the early universe seed structure formation in the inflationary theory and result in galaxies and cluster of galaxies. And the quantum gravity or quantum fields which violate the energy conditions, possibly even avoiding the initial singularity, something which I mentioned yesterday. There are actually singularity-free solutions nowadays available to us because quantum fields can violate the energy condition, rho plus 3p greater than naught. Just as another kind of example of bottom-up interactions, uh, which is rather important for us, you may all know that the early universe, the, atmosphere, the early history of the Earth, the atmosphere of the Earth was methane and ethane. It was totally poisonous, and the atmosphere was changed by microbes on the surface of the Earth who switched the atmosphere to oxygen and made more complex life systems possible. i just throw that in as another nice example of bottom-up interactions. Now, let's look at some top-down interactions. And the point about this is it is the large-scale evolution of the universe which determines the outcome of local physical effects. For instance, the expansion of the universe causes the cooling of the microwave background. The temperature scales uh, inversely with the scale function. It's 2.73 degrees today, but if we look back to higher redshifts, the temperature of the background radiation is 2.73 into 1 plus the redshift. So the expansion of the universe is determining the environment of the radiation and therefore determining the temperature of the radiation at each point in the universe. Now that's a top-down effect from the universe as a whole, the scale factor of the universe as a whole, determining the temperature of the photons in each little part of the universe. So that's a top-down effect. Similarly, nuclear synthesis. The outcome of nuclear synthesis depends on the expansion rate of the universe at that time. And I had this temperature-time relation written a short time ago. 
And if nucleosynthesis is, if the time scale was much faster or much slower, element abundances would have been completely different. Now, where does this come from? It comes from the Friedman equation, as I showed you just a slide or two ago. And so this is the universe as a whole determining the temperature time relation through nucleosynthesis in tiny little volumes that determines the way that the protons, neutrons, deuterons interact with each other to produce helium and lithium in the very early universe. If we go to later times, structure formation, there's an equation we haven't seen yet, but this is the simplest equation for structure formation in the early universe. The gradient of the density function, second derivative, plus two-thirds the expansion rate of the universe times the first derivative of that function, minus a half the density times that function is zero. That's the basic equation for growth of gravitational perturbations in the universe. Now, the point about it is in order to solve this equation, you have to know the coefficients of this perturbation equation. You have to know the expansion rate theta and the energy density mu. You have to know those as functions of time. Well, that comes, again, from the Friedman equation. And so in order to solve structure formation in the early universe, you must find that function and that from the Friedman equation. So, for instance... For the Einstein de Sitter background, the scale factor goes as t to the two-thirds. The expansion is, is 2 upon uh, t, and the energy density is a third theta squared, which then becomes 4 thirds, 1 over t squared. You put that into there, and you put that into there, and then you can solve that equation, which now takes this form, to get the standard structure growth uh, solution, two-thirds, growing mode, and uh, t to the minus 1 in decaying mode. And notice what has happened because of the structure of the universe. We would have had exponential of structure in a non-expanding background. The fact that the structure of expansion is zero, the solution is actually exponential. And the exponential has changed to a power law because of the expansion of the universe. And that's what underlies the way that structure grows as the universe expands. So this is, again, top-down action of an extremely important kind. The way that galaxies formed locally in the universe is, form, is determined by um, in, in this way. So, top-down interactions, what you have is the universe determining the primordial elements, the galaxy structure, the large-scale structure. It is this that then enables galaxies and stars to form the first and second generation of stars, the heavy elements. That then enables planets to form geology, <laughs> atmosphere to take place, providing the basis for biosphere, the oceans, the new atmosphere which replaces the old one, and enables life to come in existence, growing from simple to complex. The expansion of the universe in influences the formation of local structure and the creation of the biosphere and life in all of the ways I have just described. It's playing a role all the time. So, in the universe as a whole, what we have is both bottom-up and top-down actions interacting with each other because, because they're both taking place, you're getting actually feedback loops there in which the one influences the other, the other influences the first, and so you've got feedback loops and this is the mutual interactions of local and global structure and physics in the expanding universe. Now, that's all standard physics. I want to go to Olber's paradox, which was actually discovered by Halley a couple of hundred years ago. And the question which underlies this is a rather strange question at first, if you've never seen it before. Why is the sky dark at night? Now, the point about this is it was realized by Halley and Olbers way, way back that you need an integration of very distant sources to determine the intensity of radiation from the universe. So what you do, 